So let's go to the passage. Man, I don't know if this has ever been done in church before here, but we're going to start with the passage. Um, Archie's going to put it up. And these are the verses that Glenn gave me to speak on. Three verses. That's it. Three verses in total. It's not going to take us too long. Matthew 19, 13 to 15. Then children were brought to him that he might lay hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus was indignant and said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. This is the passage that we have been given by Glenn to think about this morning. So we're going to think about it in three bits. Bring, hinder, and blessing. Let's start with bring. Next one. Then children were brought to him that he might lay hands on them and pray. Now, as good exegetes, what do you notice about this first bit? Do you see that it doesn't say then parents brought their children to Jesus to bless them? The word parents is not there in the Greek. It just says then children were brought to him. And actually, um, this story is in Mark and Luke as well. And Mark uses the word for babies. So there were little children, as well as maybe bigger children, the word children could be primary age children, that people brought to Jesus. It wasn't just parents. I'm sure it was grandparents and aunties and uncles and neighbors and friends and anyone who heard Jesus is here, quick, grab a child. <laughs> Let's take the child to Jesus to bless them. Anybody could bring a child to be blessed by Jesus. And so we're going to start by thinking about children that we want to bring to Jesus. And this is the first bit of the interactive bit that you have to do. On your table, you have a piece of paper. And what I would like each of you to do, including the children, because they can bring other children to Jesus, is think about the name or names of some children that you would like to symbolically bring to Jesus. Now, it could be the actual name of a child. It could be the names of lots of children. You might even not know their name, but be like that really annoying neighbor's kid next door <laughs> that I want to bring to Jesus. It could be a whole people group, like the children of Ukraine. Anything that is on your heart that you think, I want to bring this child to Jesus. On one side of the paper, you're going to use the other side later, so just on one side, write the name and maybe decorate it. You've got pens on your table if the pens don't work. Now, while you're doing that, with the people at your table, you might want to tell them about this child. You don't feel you have to, but you might just want to say, this is my neighbor's child, and they throw balls at my window, and it's really annoying. <laughs> I'm going to try and help them. Or this is my um, friend's kid who's sick, and I want to bring... Just tell them about it. The other thing I want you to tell the people at your table about is your earliest childhood memory. Now, for some of you, that might be harking back a little bit, <laughs> but try and think about when you were a child, what that felt, the kind of memories that you have. So we're going to take a few minutes to do this. The name of a child just on one side, you can decorate it, there's pens, and then talk about your earliest childhood memories. The instructions are on the screen. Just a couple minutes doing this. Okay, thank you. On you go. Okay, so just keep that sheet on front of you. We're going to come back to that sheet in a moment, but we're going to go and kind of walk through the next bit of the passage. So the first bit was children were brought to Jesus, and we've started that process in this sheet of paper. But let's look at the next bit, this bit in red. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus was indignant and said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Now, I have to tell you a little bit about this before we go on. The word rebuked in Greek is just what you would imagine. It's just this kind of harsh, kind of telling them off. This bit, this indignant, do you see in brackets this little bit indignant? Remember I said that this story is told in Matthew and Mark and Luke. In Matthew, indignant isn't there. That's the passage Glenn gave me. But in Mark and Luke, it has this word that they were indignant. So I did a little bit of research into this word, indignant, in Greek. 
And there are only seven times this word is used in the whole New Testament, seven times. And for some of them, it's the same story that's told in two different places. So there are actually only four stories, plus this one, where this word indignant is used. When did people feel indignant in the Bible? Let me tell you, they're all pretty familiar stories. So there was a time when James and John, the disciples, came to Jesus and they said, hey, Jesus, we're your favorites, aren't we? Can we just sit on either side of you and we'll be the ones that are the top table? And the other disciples were like, you snakes! We're indignant! We're so cross that you went behind our backs and tried to be the favorites of Jesus. The other disciples were indignant at James and John. Second time it's used. When Jesus healed on the Sabbath, he made somebody better. Sabbath, you're not meant to do it. It's a day of rest. The synagogue leaders were indignant at Jesus. They were so cross at Jesus for healing on the Sabbath. The third time it's used was when Jesus went into the temple. And you know, I was acting this out with one of my classes the other day, and there happened to be a table that was empty at the start of the, table, the, the classroom, and I just went and I lifted up the table, and you should have seen the kids just like, what are you doing? But it's when Jesus went into the synagogue, and he was so cross at what they were doing that he just like lifted up all the tables and threw it away. And the chief priests were indignant at Jesus for doing that. That's the third story where it's used. And the fourth time this word is used was when Jesus was in a house and a lady brought the expensive jar of perfume and broke it open on his feet and the disciples were indignant. What a waste. This money could have been sold and used for the poor. Those are the other times this word is used. And so if you notice, this passage is the only time that Jesus was indignant. The only thing in the whole New Testament that made Jesus indignant, we are told, it's when people stop children coming to him. That's pretty strong, right? There's lots of other things that you could have got indignant about. And indignant um, translated, the word kind of literally translated means much grief. This is what caused Jesus, and we, no other things caused him grief. He wept over Jerusalem other times. But this is the time where the word is used. Jesus was indignant when children were hindered from coming to him. So we're going to think about that. And you have another sheet on your paper, on your table, which says, is type sheet, and it says, that's the, how do people hinder children coming to Jesus? You see this. And what I want you to do, and again, I'm sorry, you have to, this is the last kind of big bit of discussion you have to do, is think about different ways that people might hinder children coming to Jesus. If Jesus felt so strongly about it, it's probably something that's worth us thinking about. So I've given three kind of headings, and I was thinking about this week how we hinder them, and one of the ways that we might hinder children is in our attitude, where we believe that they are better seen and not heard, that they're just a nuisance. Let's just get rid of them. Let's just keep them away. We, we hinder them in our attitude. Sometimes, and this I feel kind of more convicted on this week, is our example the way that we set an example for them, the way that we show them how important Jesus is, or the way that we teach them, and the way that we do things that show them what we think. And theology might be another way. How we treat our theology affects how we treat children. So each of these three headings in your groups have a little chat, and somebody could just jot down ways that we might hinder children. And then on the back, it says, how can we get rid of these hindrances? Let's try and be proactive and think about any ways that we can get rid of these hindrances. It might be helpful for you. This is why I got you to think about your early childhood memories. Have you ever, or do you remember, if you came to church as a child, some way that somebody hindered you? Some attitude, or the flip side, a way that somebody welcomed you, <laughs> made you feel special, and that could be how you get rid of these hindrances. So again, just a few minutes with the people at your table having a chat. How can we, how do we hinder and how can we um, get rid of these hindrances? So just a few moments together in your um, little tables, and then we'll come back. Thank you. Yes. Jesus obviously thought it was really important not to hinder children coming to them. And I wonder if um, my mom was reading uh, Rowan Williams this week, and she said that he was asking, put yourself in this story. Where are you? Are you a bringer or are you a hinderer? <laughs> Which one do you tend more towards? And that may be something that you're like, actually, yeah, I'm a bringer. I've, or sometimes I tend towards hindering. Which one do you tend towards? And maybe some of these discussions might help you to think how you could move uh, more towards a bringer if you're a hinderer. Right, the last session, the last section, sorry. Um, 
Jesus blessed them. The children were brought, the disciples tried to stop it, Jesus was too important, and Jesus said, no, don't stop them, bring them, and he blessed them. And what I want you to do just now is to symbolically bless these children that are on your sheet. So I want you to turn your piece of paper over where the children are, and on your desk you have, on your desk, that's my school language, on your desk, you have um, a little pack of papers with a paper clip on it. Can you see that? What I find really helpful, I have four godchildren, and one lives in New York, one lives in New Zealand, and two live in Aberdeen, so I don't see them that often, and I try and keep in touch to find out about them, but it's really hard to know specifics how to pray for them. And one of the things that I find really helpful is using verses to pray for them. When Tom was born, um, Psalm 1 just somehow became his chapter, and I use that kind of regularly to pray for him, that he would become like a tree planted by streams of water with his roots going deep. And that's the kind of verse that I use when I'm praying. Karis has got a million different verses. Her verses just like change all the time. So I use lots of different verses um, to pray for her. But what I've given you, and you don't need to use these, but are some verse ideas that I use to pray for children and particularly to pray for people when you don't really know how to pray for them. And so on the back of your sheet, I'd like you to write a blessing for them. You can use one of these verses, you can make up your own, you could use a different verse, however you want to do it. This is just something you can do yourself to think about how you could bless, ask God to bless this child or these children. So the verses will be on the screen if you can't see or if you want to um, see it. Have a read of them, share them around with the people at your table. If one really strikes you, just take it and write it on the back. We're going to, at the end of this session, kind of just spend a minute praying for these people. So this is just kind of preparation for actually taking them to Jesus. So just spend a moment looking at the verses, thinking about any others, and then write out a blessing on the back of your sheet of paper for these child. That's just a couple minutes. Thank you. Just as you finish writing these verses, we're going to spend one minute asking God to bless these children. And I'm going to time it, so it really will just be one minute. And what I encourage you to do is just to close your eyes if it's helpful, or just look at your bit of paper, whatever helps, and just kind of, in my head what I do is I just kind of picture standing before God and just kind of having the child beside me. God asks that you would bless this child, that you would keep them, that you would, whatever your blessing is for them. One minute, now say it in your head, if it helps you just to kind of mumble the words, you can say it like that. We're just gonna spend one minute collectively bringing these children to Jesus so that he can bless them. Keep this bit of paper. I encourage you, put it in your bag, put it in your pocket, take it away, use it this week to pray for these kids. And if you um, want to take any of these verses away, take them away, use them to pray, not just for children. They're, it's great to be able to use scripture to pray um, for lots of different people. So that's the passage that Glenn gave us. We are to bring children to Jesus really important to Jesus and we can hinder it but if we can get over that then we bring them and Jesus will bless them that's what he wants us to do and we're going to come to communion and I'm going to use a verse that is not in the Matthew passage that Glenn gave me but is in the Mark and Luke passages so we're going to use that to help us as we come to communion in the Mark and the Luke passages there's another verse at the end of the story that says, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And I've been thinking about that this week, what this means. I think it means lots of different things. I don't think there's like a one kind of meaning for it. But I was thinking about what it means to receive it like a child. And I was helped in that thinking by our holiday. We have just been to Denmark and we went to Billund, which is the capital of children, uh, principally because that's where Lego was born, and Tom is a massive Lego fan. And we went to, I think, almost every Lego shop in Denmark. Feels like we went to every Lego shop in Denmark, and it's perused significantly. But I was thinking about this particular Lego set, which is the Death Star and it's over 400 pounds. And every now and then, Tom decides that he's gonna save up for it. Do you have the Death Star? 
No, <laughs> it's a lot of money to save up. And I was thinking, imagine, and I haven't done this, so don't get excited, but imagine if I was like, as an illustration for this sermon, I have bought the Death Star and claimed it on expenses, but my husband's the treasurer, so I didn't think that would um, fly. But imagine if I pulled out the Lego Death Star for Tom and handed it to him this morning and said, here's a gift. Would he feel guilty? No. <laughs> would he feel like he doesn't deserve it? No. <laughs> would he feel, oh, I don't think I could take this, no, take it back, no, take it back. No, he would be like, oh. <laughs> he knows what it costs. He knows how much it costs. And he would be super thankful. And he would open it and he would get started and he would build it and he would take his time doing it and he would enjoy it. And then he would keep coming back to me. Thank you so much, mommy, for buying this. Thank you, thank you. And over the years to come, we would be like, do you remember that sermon when I gave you the legs? <laughs> I mean, I really wish I'd done it, but... Um, he would remember it, and we would tell the story as a family. Do you remember that? He would receive it unselfconsciously, without the sense that he was unworthy, just knowing that I loved to give him good gifts, and he would be super thankful. And I wonder if that's something about receiving it like a child. When God offers us these gifts, sometimes we're like, oh, I haven't actually been good enough. No, I don't know if I can do it. Instead of just going, oh, I know how much this costs and I appreciate that you are a parent who loves me. Thank you so much, and enjoying it. I wonder if that's something to do with receiving it like a child. But this first bit about the kingdom of God, ooh, this is like a whole sermon series. You could spend your whole life trying to work this out. I'm not going to do it here. Um, but let's scratch the surface a little bit. When Jesus died and rose again, something changed. And it's not fully changed, right? Because we look at the world, we, we, we can see all the mess that's there, but something changed. When Jesus came out of the tomb that Easter morning, it was a kind of new world of justice and joy and hope. It was launched then. Not fully realized, but it's been launched. And we have been invited to be part of that. God has said, do you want to come? Do you want to come be part of this new world that's this world of hope and joy and peace? Right here, right now. It's not about sitting back going, yeah, I'm okay, I'm a Christian, I'm going to heaven when I die. That's absolutely not what the Bible says. It's saying right here, right now, God is trying to bring his kingdom on earth. That's what we say when we say the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. There's some way that right now things can be changed. And we have been invited to be part of that change. We have been invited to work towards that. And how do we work towards that? I think love is a massive part of it. I think loving each other, looking out for each other. I think loving the planet, caring for the planet. You know, Martin Luther was told, was asked, if you heard that Jesus was coming back tomorrow, what would you do? What did he say? Plant a tree. This world is not going to dissolve. It's not going to go away. Somehow it's going to be renewed even more. And we can be part of that just now. Loving others, loving our planet, loving ourselves. Because the creator of the universe says you're lovely. And loving God. And we have been invited to be part of this great kingdom project. And it's about recognizing that as a gift. And not going, oh, no, I can't. I'm not good enough. Just going, wow, thank you. Let's enjoy it. <laughs> Let's get building. And so we come to communion. And kids, you aren't normally in for this, but we're glad you are, actually. And I know that Mimi's talked to you about communion. But basically what happened was that Jesus was sitting, hanging out with his friends. And they were having a meal. And at the end of the meal, he picked up the bread because that was what was on the table. I, do you know, this week I had a crazy thought. Imagine if they were having pizza. And then he picked up pizza at the end of the meal. And we'd be having pizza instead of bread. That could have been quite cool. Pizza slices. But he picked up the bread because that was what was on the table. And he said to his, his friends, this is my body. And he picked up the wine because that's what they were drinking. And he said, this is my blood. And I can almost guarantee the disciples were like, what on earth is he talking about? They had no idea. Then, maybe a couple of days later, a few months later, they began to understand it a little bit. And... Paul wrote later in the New Testament saying, we need props. 
We're so bad at remembering. And so Paul said, see this bread and the wine? Every time you take it, just go, oh, yeah. Jesus died so that I can have a, a relationship with God so that we can start bringing about the kingdom on earth, so that we can be part of this project, so that we can love one another and love the planet and love God and love ourselves. And what we're doing here is just remembering and being thankful and saying, yeah, I'm going to get stuck in. I'm going to start working with you on this kingdom project, building not the Death Star, but building the kingdom.